Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor is one of the most famous TV taglines of all time. Many of you knew exactly what I was talking about as soon as I said it. It's from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and it's aligned to the opening song for the show, and here's how that song goes. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, won't you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please, won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor? Famous song. But even after we sing that song, we still don't know the answer to the question about neighbors from our gospel reading today. Who is my neighbor? Who is he talking to? And that's a very important question for the Christian to ponder, because all of the Christian life hinges on the answer to that question. It hinges on the answer to the identity of our neighbor. Well, have no fear. Today, we'll get an answer from our text in the gospel reading to this question, and that answer will be, I am your neighbor. But we need to read on to find out who exactly it is that is saying, I am your neighbor. See, right from the outset of our gospel reading, we're dealing with legalism and the law, which isn't all that surprising. The person talking to Jesus is a lawyer after all, and that is his business and trade. But it also tells us that the lawyer from the very beginning is desiring to put Jesus to the test isn't sure about this Jesus guy, and he wants to test him. And he does that by asking a question that he knows the answer to, or at least he thinks he does. So if you go back in your bulletin to the gospel reading, you'll see that question. He says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what we'll begin to see is that this question is even more central than the question, who is my neighbor? In fact, this question and its response is what prompts the question, who is my neighbor in the first place, and sets the stage for really why Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan in the first place. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus knows this guy is a student of the law, of the Torah. He's a member likely of the the Pharisee party of the Jews. And so he says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answers, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Amen. We're done. Have a good day, everybody. But the interaction continues for some reason. He has the answer he was looking for. In fact, he even supplied the answer himself. So it seems like the interaction should be complete, and yet the lawyer asks an additional question. He's still unsatisfied, despite not only getting the answer that he was expecting, but the one that he already knew to this all-important question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So why does he need to stick around? Well, the text tells us why he follows up with this next question. It says, but he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? desiring to justify himself. Well, why would he need to do that? He got the answer correct. 
seems pretty straightforward. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. All right, get to it. But something in him knows that that is too tall an order. And so what does he do in order to justify himself? And I'm afraid that we're all familiar with this tactic. Maybe not about this particular question, but it's the route we often try to take ourselves. He wants to narrow the definition of one of those words to make the commandment attainable. And so he says, desiring to justify himself, who is my neighbor? He got the answer, and he knew it already to his previous question, but that question, like it does us, nails him to a wall. Because your initial reaction to such a grand statement of what must I do is, I can't do that. So let's pare down one of those words to make it manageable. Because after all, God didn't really mean that, did he? So as a Torah-abiding Pharisee, Jesus knows this, and he knows what's behind the question, right? He has a certain set of people who he thinks qualify as a neighbor, and a certain set of people who don't, and that's really the key, right? He's arguing for a group of people that he's not going to be obligated to by this commandment, and that really drives the characters chosen in the story that Jesus tells because he wants to intentionally challenge this self-justification. So we get the Good Samaritan story. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you know the story, right? He gets waylaid by robbers who strip him, beat him, and leave him half dead. And three people walk by. The first, a priest. The lawyer's definition of neighbor most certainly applies to this guy. He's a priest. He's one of the important people from the temple, which is the central key to fulfilling the commandments and the law of God. He's surely somebody who qualifies as a neighbor. And yet, he passes by on the other side of the road and does nothing. And then a Levite, and a Levite is a Jew of the tribe of Levi whose job was to assist the priests in the temple. So another important person in Jewish society, somebody certainly who would qualify as a neighbor to anyone who pays any attention to the law. And yet, he does the same. Passes by on the other side of the road, offers no aid. And then the Samaritan shows up. Now remember, just a couple of weeks ago, for the very fact that Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem, what happened when he went to Samaria? He was rejected. Yet here he uses a Samaritan to upend this lawyer's understanding of who his neighbor is. Because the Samaritan, his despised enemy, stops and has compassion on the man. He's certainly not a neighbor to the lawyer, or at least he doesn't think he is. The hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans were such that they would avoid and take extra time to go around one another's places. So the fact that this man, this man who was waylaid by robbers, was coming from Jerusalem should have been enough reason alone for the Samaritan to totally ignore him and move on. And yet he has compassion on him and treats his wounds, binds him up, places him on his own animal and takes him to an inn and takes care of him. And then Jesus' question to the lawyer after he tells the story, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer answers honestly, he says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, you go and do likewise. 
It seems obvious what Jesus means, right? Well, not really, actually. In fact, this text is often deeply misunderstood. What does this story really tell to somebody who is specifically trying to justify himself by asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? The answer is what the lawyer feared. The answer is the reason that he was trying to justify himself. So his worst nightmares are true. He wanted to narrow the definition of neighbor to something he could manage, but it turns out it actually means everyone, even a Samaritan. Even your enemy is your neighbor. And so he's thrust back to the response that prompted the question in the first place, which is, I'm not really sure I actually keep that commandment. You probably have some resonance with that because we often have that same interaction with our Lord, don't we? Did He really say that? Does He really mean that? Maybe this word means something else. Maybe I'd like to take a couple of these words and put them on my own terms so I can manage them, so I can at least feel like I'm doing something. And then Jesus tells you a story, and your worst nightmare comes true. It really is what He means. And I don't get to change the definition of His words. And all I'm left with is, I can't do that. Because we like to think, just like the lawyer, that, well, you know, we're doing something to make ourselves worthy, something to earn that eternal life, checking those boxes, doing the things I ought to do. And maybe not quite like him, maybe I don't think I can fully do it, but maybe just some small part just I'm not totally helpless. And Jesus responds to that thinking by saying, well, love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Simple. Go for it. Do it. And you will live. So what are we waiting for? It's no wonder the lawyer sought to justify himself. So do we, because we are terrible at loving God with all of our being and loving our neighbor as ourselves, just like he was. And we follow that same tactic. But what does this really mean? To make it something that we can wrap our minds around. Because otherwise, I'm simply left with, I can't do that. I don't do that. Why don't I do that? Because I don't like that person. I have better things to do. This is my money. I made it. I don't need to give it to somebody else. I'm too busy. I've got places to be and people to see. I can just imagine that's what the priests and the Levite were saying to themselves. I've got important business to attend to. I cannot be bothered with something like this. I can't do it. You can't do it. Is this really a hopeless endeavor? Well, to use the words of Jesus with the lawyer, if you say that, then you have answered correctly. If we're the Good Samaritan, it is indeed a hopeless endeavor. I am your neighbor. It isn't a statement that we make to others. The purpose of Jesus' answer is to establish who is the one that does the neighboring, and it isn't you and me. We aren't the Samaritan in the story. This isn't a story about how we should love all people because all people are your neighbors. This particular story is about remembering 
that Jesus is responding to somebody who's trying to justify themselves in the eyes of the law. Somebody who's trying to think they can get this thing done themselves. What happens when we take that tactic with God? Doesn't end well for us. We get crushed. Really, everyone is my neighbor? He really means all of that. I don't have that kind of love. Some of the people I can manage, but it's too hard to love my enemies. I can't even love people I don't like very well. Certainly not as much as I love myself. So if we're supposed to be the Good Samaritan, dear friends in Christ, the world is doomed. And so are we. But fortunately, we're not. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. He is the one saying, I am your neighbor. He's the one who can be neighbor to literally everyone. And we've all made ourselves his enemy, and yet when he sees us, he has compassion on us. And he binds up our wounds and bears our burden and pays the full price to heal us and restore us. You may have guessed it by now who we are in the story. We're that certain man who got beaten up and left half dead, unable to save ourselves, until the Good Samaritan comes along, until Jesus comes along. So, dear friends in Christ, there's no need for self-justification. Jesus has all of the justification that we need. He does all the work of justifying that is ever going to be done, and it has been fully completed. He has loved everyone, including God, perfectly. He is the fulfillment of the law the lawyer answers to. He is the one who loves God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and his neighbor as himself. He loves all people everywhere, all his neighbors, and yes, even you. Neighbor to Jesus, now made child of God. Now, this isn't to say that we aren't called to attempt to do these things with others in our lives. But that's not what this story is about. This story is to sweep away all of our self-justification. All of our thoughts of thinking that we are earning some part of our salvation. That we can accomplish the law. For as long as we remain focused on that, we don't see Jesus And so, he lets the law speak for itself and simply says, if you can do that, go and do it and you will live, knowing that we can't. But as we said a couple of weeks ago, he set his face to Jerusalem. And what did he set his face to Jerusalem for? To go and do the very thing we cannot to fulfill the law perfectly, to love God with all his being and love his neighbors as himself, you, me, and everyone else. And he really means it. In the name of Jesus, amen.